Good evening, everybody. Hope uh, hope everyone's doing very well. We had a nice few days of beautiful Oregon late spring summer, and now we're back to what we're used to. So, uh, very excited about our webinar tonight, and uh, of course, joined again by Mr. Dan Hayes and uh, with Real Property Management. Dan, say hello. Hey, everybody. And also joined uh, by David Moore. If you remember from last year, we did a great uh, 1031 Exchange webinar. David Moore over at Equity Advantage, say hello to the crowd. Hello, everyone. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna do something that I've literally never done before because I hated when presenters did this, but if apparently I need to. Can you, any, can you make a note in the chat box if you can hear me? Because apparently I keep, I don't, if you can't hear me, I don't know how you're supposed to know to do this, but uh, I need to make sure that everyone can hear the audio. Perfect. Dan Hayes can hear me. All right. Thank you so much for your help, Dan. Uh, anybody else? Can anybody else hear me or am I speaking into the void? Oh, man. Looks like it's the void, everybody. Anyone? I, I can hear you. David Moore can hear me. Well, you know what? If you can't hear me, it's going to be recorded. So <laughs> you guys can just do that then. Um, all right. Let's do the uh, let's do the introduction. Um, well, let me go over the agenda real quick. Um, Introduction, we went over Dan Hayes, uh, David Moore. Uh, I'm gonna do a bit, about five minutes on uh, a market update for um, apartment sales, flex sales. Dan's gonna give us some, some rental market update information. And we're gonna jump into the 1031 exchange basics. And then lastly, uh, we're gonna talk about the proposed changes to the 1031 capital gains stuff that basis, and then end with a Q and A. It's gonna be a very exciting night. Uh, again, here's your hosts. Myself, Ben Ficker, Dan Hayes with the Property Management, and David Moore. We'll have this slide with all of our contact info at the end as well. Um, real quick, on the Q&A piece of it, if you have questions throughout the presentation, don't use the chat box for that. Use the question box. Um, oh, hey, look at that. Everyone was, uh, everyone was saying they could hear me in the question box, not the chat box. Um, so... <laughs> Oh, look, we're we're only twelve into this. One of these days, I'm going to figure it out. So they listen to you, Ben, about the whole oh, Q and A thing. You know what? One of them, one of them can't see the chat box. So I wonder, I wonder if they just don't have a chat box. That's that's perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. So everybody knows knows where the uh, question and answer box is. That's perfect. That's where your questions go. Um, that'll give me a chance to keep in line what questions we need to answer. If I know we're going to answer it later, we'll get to it then. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, if you don't know me, um, I'm a, I'm a multifamily broker with Equity Pacific Real Estate. I've been doing real estate since 2004, uh, at the ripe old age of 21. I'm 28 or 30, 28, 38 now. Uh, I've been doing multifamily specifically here at Equity Pacific since 2015. I've got an incredible wife uh, since 2017 and my wonderful son since 2019. There's my beautiful wife. There's my beautiful son. And here's the market stats, the beautiful data that we like to look at. So here we go, market stats. This is pulled from CoStar. Um, so it's not gonna include Plex information, which those numbers are significantly higher for Plexes, but we wanna focus on apartments today. So um, they, CoStar has a rating from one star to five stars. Um, and we, most of our markets in that one to three star range, the newer luxury level stuff that you see, that's the four and five star, five star type stuff. So uh, for most of the most of the people on today, this is where your properties are going to um, are going to fall anyway. So right now the market sales price per unit is uh, two hundred twenty two thousand a door. So if you got uh, ten units, that puts you at two twenty two or two two point two two million, right? Something like that. Um, that is up 6.35% over the same time last year. I'm not gonna go over all the data, but uh, the price per unit is uh, important. Market cap rate, um, that's actually 4.65%. That's down from 4.75. That's a pretty significant drop um, over the last year. And, and if you're not familiar with the cap rate, that drop in cap rate means a higher price for you based on your actual rents. That's a big deal for you if you're thinking of selling your property. Um, the the other interesting one that I wanted to point out was this for sale listing. So the again, apartments. So 22 might not sound like a lot of apartments for sale right now on LoopNet, ready to go. Um, Dan, can you guess 
same time last year, how many apartments were for sale? We got 22 this year. How many were for sale uh, last year? Uh, I'm going to say 53. Two. There were two last year. You went completely the wrong way. This is uh, a say, you know, th this is indicative of the markets opening back up. Remember last year, Got it, started yeah. the pandemic, right? So people were taking their stuff off the market, not sure what was going on. Everything's starting to open back up. This is actually, I think they said, a, I think they said a 957% increase over the same time last year. Uh, that's a lot. So um, all of that to say, there's still more demand than there is available properties. So um, my boots on the ground perspective here, oh, where's my, my mouse there? Boots on the ground perspective, we're seeing a huge demand for owner occupied plexes, um, specifically duplexes. Although uh, I, I've sold a few this year, um, we've actually had a couple go to straight up investors versus owner ox, but there's still a huge demand for that owner occupant uh, status. Um, and then well-maintained apartments and decently performing properties. So if your rents are within one to two years of, of, of a rent raise um, and you're performing well, expenses are, are okay, uh, you're, there's a lot of demand for those properties right now. There's always a demand for the major fixers, but people are willing to spend money on those turnkey or close to turnkey properties right now. Um, so if you have anything like that, We've got uh, we've got buyers, and there's a lot of buyers out there for for exactly that. Um, the the last thing um, I wanted to mention, um, we normally I normally say this up front. And I'm sorry I forgot it. We're not here to browbeat you into working with us. What we want to do on our webinars is provide you with so much value that when the time is right, whether it's three months or three years from now, when the time is right to talk to you about uh, hiring professional management or going into an exchange. Um, that you talk that, that we at least get an invitation to the table uh, to have that discussion and then then you're free to work with whoever you want but um, we'd at least like to earn a seat at the table so hopefully we can do that for you tonight okay I'm done with my little bit no one's here to listen to me they want to hear David on the 1031 anyway uh, Dan you are up next so I'm gonna go ahead and move this over move this over to you in one second um, Dan, you are the presenter. Why don't you uh, fill us in on what's going on? First of all, can you can you see my screen, Ben? I sure can. All right. So normally I give you a rental market update in terms of rent trends, vacancy rates, et cetera, et cetera. But Senate Bill 282 is on its way to the governor's desk. She may have already signed it. Uh, but I wanted to spend just a few minutes, because I'm not the feature sp speaker tonight, David is, uh, importantly so around 1031 exchanges but I wanted to maybe give you a little bit of a teaser about Senate Bill 282 uh, because it will be passed I don't have a full-on detailed review for you tonight uh, of course we just got our attorneys summary today so what I'm going to do is just give you a quick one pager about what the highlights are but if you want to see the video that I'm going to produce tomorrow with the details, just send me an email. I'm happy to send it back to you. OK, but Senate Bill 282 is about to become law and it does do a couple of important things. Number one, we are about to transition into just a grace period. A pretty well established fact, I think, at this point that we're not going to extend the eviction moratorium and the emergency period but we are for sure going to extend the grace period to February of 22. Uh, it does do uh, some things around uh, how we can operate as landlords. Number one, you should know that when a non-payment balance, that's the amount of money, any money that a tenant owes you that occurred during the, the emergency period, whether they prof uh, provide you a declaration form or not, it is going to go into that grace period. Okay, and I'm going to give some details about that tomorrow, some examples. That means that if you have a tenant that has not paid you rent and has not submitted a declaration form, I recommend you take action now because on July 1, anything they owe, declaration or not, is going to get kicked to February of 2022. 
Okay. There are certain actions that are not allowed by landlords before the end of the grace period for non-payment balances, regardless of declaration status. Your ability to take action on non-payment balance, late fees, etc. Okay. You also need to know that any actions that you take to collect a non-payment balance that occurred during the emergency period will be prohibited starting July 1 and last until March. That means that let's say you have a tenant that you're currently taking action on for non-payment on July 1. If that's not done, you'll probably have to rescind. Okay. You cannot report non-payment balance to a credit agency now forever. There are also some rules around how you'll be screening tenants relative to non-payment balances and FEDs for the period between now and actually 2028. And there is also some language around what's called non-tenant guess. It's actually a thing now and you have to allow it. So enough changes that if you are self-managing your properties, you should read Senate Bill 282. Uh, and certainly if you want to get a, a copy of the video or link to the video, I will have that produced by the end of the day tomorrow and that will give you a summary of what all of this means. Okay, Ben, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And I do that by doing how. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Oh, you have sorry, it? I was still muted. I got it. I sent it over to no. David Moore. Uh, David, I believe you are presenter now. Here we go. No. Dan, that was just heart lifting. I, I'm, I'm excited at all those great changes you mentioned. I'm the bearer of good news always. <laughs> ben, one question I do have before David gets started. When are we going yeah. to have this meeting in person where we can have some proper refreshments and shake a few hands and meet a few people in person? That's something we should probably answer. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for August, but uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll, bet, I'll bet August we could do something at that point. Fingers crossed. Have a great session, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Take care, Dan. Take it away, David. Ben, we ready to go? Yes, we are. Let's do it. All right. So, hey, we've got 30 minutes. I've, I've got a lot of information in this 30 minutes. I don't know what people's background is, uh, the attendees today, but I'm going to give you sort of my my perception or perspective of 1031s and, and my background. I laugh because you're talking 200. What was, it? what was that number? 220 something a unit? Ben? Yeah. Yeah, yep, so when I, when I moved to Oregon in 1990, I moved from the Bay Area, and uh, the first apartment I bought was in Salem, uh, and we paid 17 a door for it. So things have changed a little <laughs> bit. But uh, anyway, got to deal with what you got out there. So yep. think of a 1031 as conduit out of what you don't want into what you do want. And as I said, my background was investing in property. We we do what we call a modified flip, and that's that's something that would fit a 1031 context. We're flipping property, dealer status property doesn't fit section 1031. You got two problems with it. One is it doesn't fit 1031. And two, you're paying normal income tax on everything, no matter how long you own it, because you held it for resale. So what we do is we buy the property, you know, rehab it, or we then do a cash out refi, hold it for a couple of years, take the refi money, go leverage it into what else we want at that time, and live off it. And then, then two, three years later, we turn the property, do an exchange in the next asset. So a lot of times the money via the refi is, is more than what you would have netted after paying taxes on disposition. So it's a great way to snowball properties. But if, if you're looking at, at uh, tax money, 1031 is sort of the IRA 401k of the real estate world. And we're, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. But uh, you know, I love real estate. It's it's the ultimate ultimate tangible asset, and and unfortunately, in in the investment world, they call real estate an alternative investment, and and I just think that's uh, ludicrous. Name an older investment than real estate. So, I was taught never to bank on appreciation. I didn't have to. I, I'd answer three questions before I bought a property. I had that sort of pummeled into my head by one of my dad's uh, good friends that was uh, that I was fortunate enough to have mentor me getting into this business. But he just says, look, if you can't answer three questions, these three questions don't buy a property. What am I going to make? How am I going to make it? When am I going to make it? And it's pretty easy when you start thinking about it. But the idea is it's all value add stuff. And if you think about what we're seeing now, Ben, you probably agree. It's If you look at new construction, it's, it's exempted from a lot of these, these uh, rent control 
issues and, and older buildings, 15 or older, are the ones that are subject to them. And that's the exact opposite of what should happen. The older buildings should be able to be turned because every time something's turned, people are spending money on it. And, and that's the way you, you reinvigorate the inventory out there. It helps every demographic. 1031s, you know, one of the things we're looking at is, is a proposal to eliminate or, or greatly uh, reduce people's ability to use Section 1031. The government thinks they're going to gain tax revenue there. But every time you lose a single real estate transaction, think of the mouths that are not being fed. You've got title escrow people, finance people, property managers. You've got Ben. He's got to feed his wife and kids, I just saw, right? So right. you think about all the people with one transaction, that's the you know, inspectors, appraisers, tax and legal people all those people are, are making revenue off a single transaction paying tax and for the sun you know for some unknown reason the government keeps coming back and saying hey we got to get rid of 1031 so we can get this money or we got to increase capital gains taxes because we need more revenue when every single study we've ever seen and i've been doing this for 30 years we have to fight a new group of knuckleheads every you know every few election terms they come up with these same ideas and and so we have to go back and prove it to them again what's different right now though is we're talking about the impact on different communities and what 1031 has done over the years but we've got a half hour and to go through the basics we're going to talk about basis and game if you look at the bottom of this uh, right below the image it says you've worked hard for your money we work hard to keep it yours 1031 is not a, it's not a tax-free exchange it's tax deferral and you know, we're, we're also looking at a proposal to eliminate uh, something called stepped up basis too. But all of these things really combine into a, a major problem. But 1031 is 100 years old, okay? It's, 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 it's 100 years old it's been there. And it, and it was first started because of farmers, you know, needing to transfer assets from generation to generation and keep things working, but keep those those people in, in play because they're, they're land rich, cash poor. And, and you think of the the cost of a transaction if you're giving up what you're looking at. And think about even the state of Oregon right now, you're looking at federal uh, st federal tax rates going up, but the state's slowly bumping theirs up. And you know, in, in, in the metro area, we're looking at max rate of 12% now, and there's rumbling of going to 15%. So you think about what that does to a transaction and, and the cost of doing these things if you have to pay the tax, and it's just a really tough thing. And we always say, 1031 is a points-free, interest-free loan from Uncle Sam for as long as you choose to take it. So you, know, you pay the tax when you choose to pay the tax. You've got the ability to defer it through the exchange. And, and once again, I want to stress it's tax deferral. It's not elimination uh, unless you do something along the lines of what I was saying earlier, swap till you drop, and then you get stepped up basis. But it's, it's something that's been there a long time. We also have a sister company, IRA Advantage, that takes uh, IRA 401k funds. If you've got the IRA 401k funds, you're uneasy about stock market right now, you want to you know, throw some money at Ben to throw it in some uh, multifamily real estate, we can help you get that done. And, and it's just further diversification. And, and let me give you this for food for thought. If you look at IRAs and 401ks, any financial advisor is going to tell you the secret to success in the investment world's diversification. So of, of roughly $30 trillion in, in Wall Street uh, IRA 401k money, 2% of that's in real estate. Yeah, and I'd say that 2% is probably primarily in REITs. So that does not sound like very good diversification to me at all. And, and real estate is the ultimate tangible assets. We all, we all hear the ads on, on the radio and see the ads on TV, people selling gold, silver, whatever it might be. And I don't know if anyone out there has bought the stuff and tried to sell it, but good luck getting the quoted rate on that stuff. But you're still betting with those tangible assets. You're betting why tangible assets, inflationary hedges, but you're betting that it's going to go up in value. Real estate does not have to go up in value to make you money, right? I mean, you've got somebody else. Uh, if it's a multifamily project, you got somebody else covering the debt service for you. You've got appreciations, the gravy that I was taught never to bank on, but you've got interest deductions, depreciation, all these things working for you. They're going to give you a nice return, even if the property never went up in value. But bottom line is it will over time. It always does. So 30 minutes going to go quick. Now if I can get my uh, slide to change. All right, so 1031 on the ropes. Like I said, this happens every few years, and really the last time we had this fight was a, a total surprise to our industry. It was when uh, President Trump was elected in, in 2017 when we had the tax reform, and, and uh, we actually lost personal property exchanges in, at that point in time. 
and and we lost them because of the opportunity zone deal and you know ben i don't know if you've had presentations on ozs but if you want one i've got some people who give a great presentation on it oz i look at an opportunity zone situation as sort of like a roth ira you've got limited tax deferral into that opportunity and then the growth of that asset is going to be tax free so it's just like a you know a roth ira is tax money growing tax free traditional ira or 401k is pre-tax money going tax deferred and that's sort of like you know 1031's tax money that's going to grow tax deferred via 1031. But if we look at this, this slide sort of quoting Keith Lamp, who's the CEO of Inland Private Capital, they have about 60% of the Delaware Statutory Trust uh, investment market. And DSTs are, are a totally passive investment. It's a place that people go when they're tired of the terrible T's, toilets, trash, dentists, turnover. Well, Keith's a good friend. Their firm's a great friend. And uh, so we actually had uh, one of their people uh, speak in January on our behalf, talking about the tax proposals that were out there. And we're doing it again in another couple of weeks. But you know, the reality is when, when these tax proposals first came out, when Biden's first tax proposals came, it was pre-COVID, right? It, he hadn't even been elected yet, it was pre-COVID. So it, we were in a different world. So in January, when we did, gave a tax update on what we expected to happen, we were thinking from the context, look, we've got a new president, he's in there. We've got this COVID situation that's gotta be dealt with. We've got obviously a, a, a problem on the border. So we've got an immigration issue that's gonna to have to be dealt with. And we really didn't expect any tax issues to be brought up during the first couple of years because it was our impression that that uh, you know the president and, and the Democratic Party would want to maintain control of the House and Senate. And if they introduced a bunch of tax reform in, in before that uh, midterm election, they were concerned they were going to lose you know control uh, of both those uh, you know departments. And and so if you look at it, we thought something that is today totally wrong. Now the attitude is, hey, you know, we're going to try to shove everything through we possibly can right now because it's sort of an assumption that they're going to lose control of the House or Senate or both in the midterms and so we're seeing a lot of different things being thrown out there uh, i will uh, never forget may 6 when when all of a sudden we got thrown in the crosshairs when he released you know released the tax uh, measures that he was wanting to see and all of a sudden 1031 uh, arises and their proposal was to restrict 1031's use to gains of a half million or less and you know who's and the idea is i think that they, they probably looked at it and said okay section 121 the universal exclusion for a home sale that came in in 1997 i would argue that the, the 250 and 500 121 offers today are ludicrously low uh i mean in in 1997 250 or 500 and gain on the sale of your home meant something today that doesn't really mean a whole lot for anybody on the west coast and many other parts of the country so i think the 500 number probably came from there but regardless you know, there's people that are thinking, well, gee, it doesn't impact me, so I'm okay with that. That would be a devastating situation. Because as I said, every time a property is sold, the buyer's typically going to improve the property. Either they're gonna scrape it, rebuild it, or they're gonna put money into it, improve it. And if you think about the, the, the rent control measures that we have to deal with and, and value add opportunities, I mean, they really stifle an owner's ability to maintain or improve properties because you just can't pay for the cost of, of taking care of those things. So, you know, historically, when a property changed hands, you would have that ability to make it happen. And, and now we're looking at a situation where even properties changing hands or even between tenants. Uh, you know, I had, a, I had a client who's a broker in this morning. He's got a bunch of uh, mobile home parks and he was talking about legislation that's coming through that would uh, totally eliminate his ability. So it, the example he gave me is he's got an old tenant that's got an old mobile home, been in there forever. And so, you know, he just wants to allow this person to age in place. And, and you know, they pass away at that point, they, they'd move the old mobile home, put a new one in and bump the rents. And there's, you know, now legislation out there that would eliminate his ability to even do that. So. He, like a lot of our people, are just saying to heck with Oregon and we're, we're going to go elsewhere. But, you know, everything that's sold is purchased by somebody. And you just got to look at what's coming on, what's happening, who's going to do what. 
But these changes, that the, the restriction on 1031 to 500, we don't really understand exactly what they're talking about. Are they talking about 500 total in, in, in gain in a year that you could defer, or is it per transaction, or exactly what are you saying? And I could foresee, people are not gonna you know, do what they can to save all their money, build all this stuff, and merely just give it away at the end of the day. So I could, I could foresee a, a situation where if you had, let's say a million dollars in gain on something, you don't wanna pay any tax, you're just gonna sell that property in two portions, two parcels at two different times. So it's just gonna make things more complicated, more cumbersome, and, and think about the finance world if that type of transaction starts happening. Now, 1031 is, like I said, it's been around for 100 years. It's, I would say it's, it's the, you know, the perfect tax deferral, tax planning tool for just the everyday Joe, because you don't have to pay, you know, if you've got a good lawyer, what are you gonna pay that lawyer an hour just to take care of something? An exchange can be done, a delayed exchange is gonna be somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500, which is, you know, maybe three hours for a lawyer, three, four hours for a good lawyer. So, I mean, the cost of an exchange is something that's out there for everybody. Anybody can do it. You don't have to have higher power tax and legal people to use it. You just use your brokers that are familiar with it. And then escrow, as soon as the deal's open, uh, we're going to step in and structure the exchange. So it's one of those simple things. It doesn't cost much for people to put together. The information's out there for people to learn and use it. And, and it's, it's a very, very good tool. And, and it just allows things to move and it allows people to improve their properties and get where they want to go. And keep in mind, a lot of times people's first investment property is, is their primary residence. Maybe they got married and had a kid. Now it's too small. They move out of it. And now that thing's an investment property. Now they would have up to three years to sell it before, you know, falling outside the two out of five that section 121 has as far as uh, occupancy. So once again, what I wanna say is you could have a home that was your home, you move out of it, treat it as a rental, as long as you sell it within three years of moving out, you still meet the two out of five, you're still entitled to the universal exclusion, you have some depreciation recapture. But think about this situation, what if you had gains that were well in, in excess of the 250 or the 500,000 on a home sale? What can you do? Maybe you got a million dollars in gain on the sale of your home. I'm gonna tell you, move out of it. Move out of it, treat it as an investment property, maybe for a year, then sell it. And by doing it that way, you're still entitled to the universal exclusions, 250 or 500, you just 1031 the overage. So a lot of times people think 1031 just applies to investment property, but we've got situations where you can convert a residence into investment, investment to residence. And our job is, is like I said at the first page, to try to keep your money yours and keep it working for you. But as, as far as this legislation, the primary thing we're concerned about right now is that situation with 1031 and its elimination and or capping it at that $500,000. Now, the stepped up basis is another thing that's very, very difficult. And, and a lot of people say, well, gee, it's not, you know, not fair. Real estate's got this great thing. And why should real estate have a, have a 1031 exchange? Wall Street doesn't have it. Well, Wall Street has all that IRA 401k funds. And I do my best to move as much of the IRA 401k funds as possible in the real estate world. But typically that's something that's Wall Street's domain. And as I said, I, I call 1031 sort of the 401k for real estate. But when you look at real estate, they say, well, you know, real estate, you got these other things. You're not paying enough in tax. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You're buying the stuff with tax money. The entire time you own real estate, you're paying taxes, unlike stocks. And, and you know, now you want us to, and we're paying tax on the income off that property all the time. And now you want to pay tax on disposition and or upon death, you want to tax us yet again. So these things are really, really difficult when you start looking at it and what it does to the real estate economy, that marketplace, and, and it just stagnates the liquidity of the, the play, marketplace. So it ultimately hurts the quality of the property, hurts the tenants, hurts everybody. And I would argue that it, you know a lot of the, the redevelopment, the improvements that we're seeing in, in you know rougher areas, where you're looking at the whole opportunity zone situation, that you gotta sort of laugh at where they placed opportunity zones. The idea was to put them in areas that needed to have you know some economic stimulus. And surprise, surprise, the Raiders Stadium in Las Vegas happened to be an OZ location. Uh, you know, as is the pearl, as is Ben. Well, you know, I mean, it's, you can see where the political fingerprints are all over this stuff. But the idea was to improve areas that needed improvement. And 1031 is going to do the same thing there. Now, th that last bullet here, increased long-term capital gains tax rates. 
Now, what are we looking at typically? If, if we're talking about real estate, if we, we sell a piece of property that's been held for under a year or held for resale, you're looking at normal income tax. If you're looking at long-term capital gains tax, you're looking at 20% on appreciation typically. You know, if you don't make much, you know, it's possible you could be at the 10 and 15 numbers, but typically our clients are gonna have, be taxed on appreciation at 20%. Depre uh, depreciation is recaptured at 25%. Uh, we're going to have on top of that, uh, the state, I've got to update this slide now, the top rate in Oregon's 12%. And, uh, you know, so Washington would be nothing. And it's sort of interesting that, that Washington just passed that uh, capital gains tax, uh, you know, measure, but it doesn't appear to apply to real property, which is sort of strange. But anyway, I'm not going to complain about that. I like it. So if we look at what you're, you're going to be paying tax on, you've got the state, the Fed, and now we still have the health care tax at 3.8% that came in when uh, President Obama was in place. So you think about what the tax rates are right now, and this is assuming it's long-term capital gains. You're looking, if you just look at, add the, add the numbers up, 20, 25%, another 12 for the state of Oregon, 3.8. I mean, you, you're losing 40% of the stuff uh, without any hesitation. And now that they're talking, the top rate they were talking about on capital gains would go up to 48% Fed. So throw the state on top of that, another 12, you're, you, you know, you're at 60% plus. I mean, that's just absurd. So I, I don't know, you know, we all have to fight this. We all have to work on it because it's not gonna be good for anybody. Uh, hopefully it goes away. And, and really the attitude in our marketplace right now is that they're pushing too hard, too fast. And that ultimately we might see an increase in appreciations tax rate. We might see it flushed up to 25% with depreciation recapture. But you know, right now, and, and you know, I'm going to knock on wood real hard uh, that we're we're not seeing uh, the the overall idea is that the 1031 won't go away. And if it is modified, it, it won't be modified to the extent they're talking about. And we're not going to see a huge massive capital gains increase, but we'll probably see some some incremental increase there. Uh, the stepped up base is a whole nother you know, discussion, but uh, you know, I just think that's one of those things where it's criminal if somebody's you know, been able to uh, uh, you know, accumulate some assets and, and they pass away. You know, it, it's just sad when the family has to sell stuff to you know, survive the tax consequences on, on, a, on, a, on a death. But, you know, it is what it is. And, and as information comes out, we're going to get information out on that. As I said, we've got another presentation coming up in a couple of weeks where I've got uh, one of the top people from CCIM certified commercial investment member. It's the commercial division of NAR. And also we're going to have uh, one of the people from uh, Inland also. Their, their uh, governmental affairs agent is going to be speaking also on that panel. So if, if you can't make the thing, uh, you always check out our YouTube channels. It'll be up there to, to watch. And if you're curious what was said in January, you can look up the, uh, just type on YouTube equity advantage, uh, 1031 exchange or tax reform, it should come up. Actually, one, one other thing on that last slide, I wanna stress this, gain has absolutely nothing to do with profit. All right, gain is merely a tax calculation. And that's one of the biggest misunderstandings I think people have. When you're looking at, at disposition of a property, gain is simply the difference between the adjusted sales price and the basis. So you're gonna take the gross, net out all brokers commissions, title escrow fees, tax and legal fees, hour fees, current prorated property tax, all those things are gonna give you an adjusted sales price. Okay? From that number, you're going to subtract the basis, and that's going to give you gain. Your basis is the purchase price plus capital improvements minus depreciation. Now, the purchase price can vary depending on how things happen. If I give Ben a property, that quote-unquote purchase price, as I described it, is, is you know, would be he's going to receive the property. If I give it to him as a gift, he'll have that purchase price basically is going to be whatever my basis is. So if I give a property to somebody, their basis is going to be what my basis is. If Ben inherited a property from me, he'd get a stepped up basis, at least today, as we've been discussing. And, and he could turn around and sell the property the next day with no capital gains tax. So, you know, that allows, once again, properties to be moved, because if you've got a big, uh, you know, big aversion to moving it because of the tax, you're not going to. And, and I would argue there's lots of people out there and, and you know, Ben probably tell you, you can drive around neighborhoods, see the beat up properties and you say, why does this person own it? Well, I'll tell you why they own it. They don't want to pay the tax on it. They can't afford to keep it, but they don't know what to do. 
So you got to give these people a place to go. And I always laugh. I said, you know, you go out, try to try to buy something from somebody. You know, you're asking them for something. But if you give them a place to go, you're probably more, op you know, you got more opportunity to get that deal done. Uh, but in this situation, understand that the gain has nothing to do with an increase in value. It, you, you can have massive decreases in value through depreciation and still have a tax consequence. Now, right below the basis on this, there's a, in bold, it says phantom gain. Now, I haven't had to deal with much in the, well, it's been a couple of years since I've dealt with phantom gain, but you know, we're at pretty high on a market. If the market takes a tank again, uh, on the short sale or a foreclosure of a primary residence, you've got tax relief on income properties you do not so in a foreclosure the debt on the property is going to be considered the sales price so if the debt exceeds the basis you've got what's called phantom gain so you could lose the property and still have to pay tax for you know to add insult to injury you lose the property and still have to pay tax on that loss so you know, we do many many transactions where we don't get any ex we get no proceeds no exchange proceeds and, and really what we're doing in those transactions with phantom gain is instead of uh buffering our client from actual or constructive receipt of, of exchange proceeds the sale proceeds which would trigger tax in this situation we're isolating them from debt relief which would trigger tax so you know, when you're looking at things, understand, gee, I didn't make any money on this property. Well, you could have lost money and through depreciation still have a tax consequence. Furthermore, you know, if you've exchanged over a number of years, you've got a basis carry forward every time you do an exchange. Pre-1997, 1034 was the old residential rollover. You sold a home, you lived in it for two years, you had two years to buy a new home and people are greater value. If you're 55 or older, you had a one-time lifetime exclusion, 125,000 in gain. You know, that thing was replaced with Section 121 in 97, and, and now we've got straight exclusions every time you sell a property. But prior to that, we had that basis carry forward. Section 1033 is involuntary conversion. If you've got a parcel of property and the city, state, some municipality wants to take it from you, use Section 1033, involuntary conversion, because it's going to give you the benefits of 1031, but instead of having the 45 and 180 days that are such a problem, you've got up to, you know, two years from the due date of the tax return to receive replacement property, and you don't have to spend all the money. So it's it's a wonderful thing. We had a lot of people on the East Side Light Rail project that, that use 1033 to take care of stuff, and it's an automatic deal. You don't need us to do anything. If you got questions on it, don't hesitate to reach out. But I've got people, tax and legal people, call us up all the time saying, hey, I need to do a 1033 exchange. You don't need us. It's an automatic uh, deferral. You just got to fit within those rules. So this slide I sort of mentioned earlier, and, and, and it's just, you know, when you think of investments, whether we're talking IRAs and 401ks or we're talking 1031s through time, you're deferring gain through the life of your investments, right? And you're not just going to give it away at the end of the day. You're going to look for some way to, to, to keep that money yours. And if we're looking at 1031s, we've got a bunch of end games, different ways you can, you can try to at least minimize tax exposure. But uh, you, know, you can always do that swap till you drop. Now, think about an IRA or 401k. Everything that you make in that account is, is going to be taxed at distribution. Now, 1031 or investment real estate, for example, you, you're always going to be looking at long or short term capital gains tax. If you just take money out of your pocket, put it in Wall Street, you're looking at short or long term capital gains tax. IRA 401k funds are taxed at normal income tax rates on distribution. So when you get to 72, you've got to take things out. Uh, 1031, you don't ever have to do that. You just keep kicking the ball down the road until you choose to pay the tax, which is a great thing because maybe this year you make a lot of money and next year you're going to retire. Well, maybe your tax consequence selling next year is going to be a lot better than this year. You choose to sell and realize the gain next year. So it's really a tool that's just going to keep your money working for you as long as you choose to do it. And at some point you choose to pay the tax or swap till you drop or or go into any number of passive investments or uh, some form of an installment sale, like a structured sale or you know charitable remainder trust, that type of stuff. Uh, if you got questions on any of those things, you can, you can take a look at our, our YouTube channels or give us a call. So what are you selling? Every time, I, I, would, I would say, print this page. Every time you go to sell a property, think about what you're selling, okay? 
what is it? What do you want it to be? And, and that second part of that question, what do you want it to be, is a very good one. Because as I said earlier, we can take a residential property, convert it into investment. We can take an investment property, convert it into residence. And we've got guidelines on doing both of those things. What about a single asset? So section 121 applies to any property that fits that two out of five in occupancy. So 10, 121 applies any property that you've lived in for two out of the preceding five years. It's not that you're living in at the time of disposition, it's just to fit the two out of five. 1031 applies to what something is at time of disposition. So two different things. Now think about this. Let's look at a duplex, half owner, uh, half owner occupied. What are you selling? One sale allocations both directions. Your residential component's gonna be 121, the investment component's 1031. How about a, uh, let's say a large property on acreage. You, you got a ranch. Well, the, the farmhouse that you live in is going to go section 121, the working land's 1031. Anybody work out of their home this last year? And if so, maybe you had a meeting. I just talked to one, my, my you know, tax counsel earlier today because he's going to be speaking, talking about these tax measures uh, to a group with me in, in a couple of weeks. And, you know, and he's just in Hawaii trying to nurse his wounds after he said a 17 month tax tax period. So uh, you know, if you look at things, you say, okay, you need to need to talk to your tax people before you ever sell anything. Understand what your liability is going to be and figure out how to work with it. But there's many reasons where, you know, if we look at that farmhouse, the, the, the house, the working land, you know, how do you define a primary residence? Number one, we've got lots of Oregonians that call themselves Oregonians. They live in Palm Desert for nine months of the year. What are they really? But, you know, how do you define a primary residence? You know, voter registration, driver's license, utility bills, uh, you know, tax returns, those type of things. But, you know, you think maybe you worked out of your home this last year and, and now you went and talked to your tax people and they said, hey, you know, you, you, you got to the point where you really enjoyed working out of your home. So why don't you just do it? And we'll just treat that home office as a home office, start depreciating it. Now you sell that home. If you've been doing that for three or more years, now that piece of your home, you sell your home, you think, gee, I just sold my home. I get section 121. No, you just sold something that's mixed use. That home office has to go 1031 or you're going to pay tax on it. So understand what you're doing, understand what you've got and what you want it to be and keep your money working the best possible way it can. Now, I gave you the example of taking an, a very expensive home and converting it into a, an investment property and still having the ability to take the universe exclusion. But on the other side, you can buy into a property uh, at the beach and, and it's a quote unquote investment property, the beach, you hold it as such for a year and you can move into it a year later. I mean, there's no black and white stated hold in section 1031. And, and keep this in mind, you might've bought a property this last year. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the tax measures earlier and, and, you know, what was going on there. But, you know, you, you've got to understand there's situations where maybe you bought the property, you thought it was going to be a great opportunity for you, and now your tenant hasn't been paying you, and now you can't afford to keep it, and you're going, gee, what am I going to do? And somebody told you, your tax counsel might have told you, gee, you bought the property with a 1031, you've got to hold it for two years to qualify. That's totally incorrect. Totally incorrect. If Ben and I are brothers, and we swap properties, there's a two-year hold in that with a related party transaction. But even in a related party transaction, you, if you can document there was no intent to avoid tax, even a related party exchange does not have an absolute required two year hold. So it, it's sort of up to you and your tax people. But if we're looking at how long is long enough, I can give you a court case where, six, or where four months was deemed long enough. People bought a property, uh, tried to rent it, documented the advertisements, the showings, uh, couldn't, get, couldn't get it rented. After four months, they moved into the property. They got audited, they got taken to court, they prevailed in court after four months. I'm not gonna tell you to do that. I say a year's a comfortable time because a year's been proposed several times and the break between short long-term tax rates on assets held for investment is out one year. But if you're that person that bought the property, you're now having economic hardship because of that thing, I'm gonna tell you, you have the ability to exchange out of it into something else. So don't get locked down on somebody say, eh, code says two years, it does not say two years. It doesn't say a year, it doesn't say anything. It just says that you're giving up property, you've held for investment and you're acquiring property with the quote unquote intent to hold for investment. So if we take and look at that beach property scenario I gave you, we exchange the end of the beach property, you hold it for a year or so, then you move into it, 
you cannot sell it within five years of acquisition. If you do, it's going to be a fully taxable sale. So that came into play around 2000. So the government between 1997 and 2000, I had so many clients that would exchange into a property, hold it a year, move into it, live in it for two, after three years, sell it, take the exclusion, get rid of all the gain. The government saw that happening. So they said, okay, we're going to put a five-year hold in this uh, that would slow this down. And that still didn't work. So in 2008, the Obama administration put in what's called the Housing Assistance Tax Act of 2008. I just love the way the government names these things. It, it, it does anything but help us. And what it says is that if you've uh, exchanged into a property, converted it from invest, investment to residence, and you have owned it for more than five years, you are entitled to use a Section 121, but you're only going to get a proration of the 250 or 500 that's in there. And the proration is attributable to gain that's attributable to qualified versus non-qualified use periods from April of 2009. I just gave you a mouthful. I don't expect you to, to, to understand what I just said. If you've got questions on that situation, let Ben know. I can get you some information on the Housing Assistance Tax Act and how it applies. But I'll leave you with this. You will never get the full 250 or 500 if you're acquiring a property via 1031, converting it, and then trying to use section 121. It doesn't work anymore. You'll get prorations. It's never gonna take care of all your gains. And, and I have people call up all the time with this great idea that that's what they're gonna do. And it was a great idea. It just doesn't work anymore. So, you know, th this sort of dovetails in back to that slide talking about what it is that you're giving. Is the property primary residence or investment? Is it both? Are you going to reinvest the, the proceeds in other real estate? If you're going to buy property, why not do the exchange? Even if, if it's only sheltering maybe a few thousand dollars in gain, why pay the tax if you don't have to? Um, do you know whether taxes are due on the sale? You know, what's going to happen? Do you have losses elsewhere to offset the gains on it? Uh, you know, are you holding the property for resale as opposed to investment? How long, if it's your home, how long have you lived there? If you've lived there for 18 months, well, the universal exclusion is not an elective. You, you don't get a prorated amount of the exclusion. If, if you're in there 18 months instead of 24, you got to be there the full two years. So you might time your sales on these things to fit. And if it's an income property, if you've held it for less than a year or you hold it for resale, you're paying normal income tax. So look at those things. And, and I'm going to say, you know, on top of having great real estate people like Ben, you, you're going to want good, competent tax people. Not some of you're going to pay them to take a position on. You're paying, you know, them to take care of you. And and the idea is they know the rules. They know what to do. You're not paying them to learn on your behalf. They're people that are going to have the skills. But get good tax people. Don't just tile some tax preparer to take care of it if you've got a bunch of real estate. And I'll tell you why. Think about a rental house. You go buy a rental house. Uh, who makes the allocation dirt to improvements? And, and if you jack up the value of the improvements, does that increase or decrease your return on investment? Well, you, you increase the value of the improvements, you increase the depreciation, you increase your cash flow. So a simple allocation dirt to an improvements on a rental house can make a huge difference in your ROI. And, and, and who's making that decision on your behalf? And I'm saying, get good tax people because they're gonna help you out in that scenario. And they're going to know where to push lines and help you take care of stuff. Think about that mixed use property where you got the farmhouse and the working land. You're probably going to want to maximize section 121, take full advantage of the 250 or 500 and then 1031 the overage. Maybe you've got a situation where you need to crank up the value of the farmhouse or knock it down, but who's going to help you do that? You're good tax people. So I'm, I'm just a firm believer that they're one of the most important people in your life. If you've got much real estate, you owe it to yourself to get a great tax person. So seasoning, we talked about this is recent court case is, is the one that I cited earlier with the four months. So if, if you've got a question or your tax people are saying, hey, you, you know, you got to hold this for this long, show them this slide. Uh, and, you know, Ben, I'm sure we've got the ability to get to get this uh, this packet to everybody that's on there. They're going to have access to it later. COVID holding. You know, once again, this is what I'm talking about. You don't have to hold that thing for any specific period of time. It's what you're doing with it. Now, even if you're a dealer, even if you're a developer, you can have investment property and property held for resale. So just look at what your the nature of the investment in that specific asset is. And every time you sell and pay the tax on something, it's going to justify where you're doing exchange on something else. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, a doctor dabbling in real estate is going to look 
look be looked at differently than you know somebody like Ben that, that's a professional in the real estate world. Okay, but just because you're a pro professional in the real estate world doesn't mean you can't do an exchange or you're not holding things for investment. Time is only one consideration. Now I like simple, so we've got these four cornerstones. I'm burning through time quick. Uh, this is what I look at with an exchange, all right? Four basic things. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I've got to deal with, but one, it's got to be an exchange. As far as you're concerned, you're selling a property, you're going to go buy a property. It's our job to turn it into an exchange. So as far as, for example, the state of Oregon, the purchase sale agreements, the state forms include boilerplate allowing you to do an exchange. It allows the buyer or seller to do it. The problem with boilerplate is it's not telling anybody that you are. So on a sale, I would encourage you to put something in addition, additional term or condition that you know buyer agrees to cooperate with sellers 1031 exchange at no additional cost or liability, something like that or delay. Uh, but you, know, you have something in there so that escrow knows that it's going to be an exchange because even after 100 years, you wouldn't believe how many calls I get the day after closing somebody wanting to do an exchange. So if you're considering an exchange, you've got to get it set up. Pre-settlement, if, if you close the deal, never touch the money. If it's sitting there in escrow waiting for you to get it, you've got what's called constructive receipt and it's too late to do the exchange. So again, in your purchase sale agreements, the state forms include boilerplate that's gonna allow you to do it, but you need to let escrow know it's going to be an exchange so they don't get it closed without being structured correctly, all right? So one, you give us something, we gotta give you something back. It's an exchange. Two, what's gonna receive have to be of like kind. Uh, three, we have to satisfy what we call the napkin test, which talks about value and equity requirements. And finally, we've got to have continuity of vesting. So if we, if we look at you know, like kind requirement, it just refers to the nature of the investment, as I said earlier. Any real property held for investment is going to be like kind with any real property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. You can go from rental house into land and apartment buildings, strip malls, a place to beach, it doesn't really matter. And, and I'll get in discussions with tax people fairly often. They say, well, gee, you know, the client never rented the property out. I say, okay, so why does renting the property out have any bearing on the taxpayer's ability to treat this property as an investment? It doesn't. If you've got a piece of dirt sitting there, corner lot, you're not renting it out. It's sitting there. It's held for speculation. You're betting that it's going to go up. And that's no different than a house that you could have purchased that way, uh, you know, a, a building somewhere that's just sitting there. All those things are going to qualify. They don't have to be rented out. If they are rented out by law, you got to understand then then you have to take depreciation. I've got clients that will call, you know, call up, go through numbers. They say, well, I never depreciated the property. It's well, was it rented out? Uh, yes. Well, okay. Did you know that the government's going to treat it as you should have, therefore you did. So you could have the tax liability for depreciation recapture without having had the benefit of depreciation. So it's really important, once again, to have good tax people to keep you on the tracks, go in the right direction. So that like kind requirement refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. When we look at value and equity requirements of the exchange, we call that the napkin test. And that just says that you need to, for total deferral, you need to go across or up in value and equity between the relinquished and the replacement property. It's not the profit. Okay, you don't have to just invest the profit. You've got to go across or up in value and equity. And people say, well, gee, when I bought it, I put $120,000 into it. I should be entitled to my 120 pulling it out without tax. No, government's position is the first money out's theirs. So you don't have the ability to pull any money out of an exchange without tax exposure. So I just want to stress that again. Any money that you pull out or anything that you receive that's not of like kind in an exchange is called boot and taxable to you. Boot could be a reduction in value, it could be cash received. Uh, one of the big fallacies I hear all the time is you have to replace debt in an exchange. Forget it, it's totally wrong. Debt can go away two ways. One by going down in value triggers tax because you went down in value. The other way debt goes away is by adding cash, which is always fine. So in recessionary times, what happens? We've got, re, you know, we've got a, a a reduction in loan to value. We typically have a reduction in equity. We might have reduction in value. And now you're you're giving up a property and you know you're gonna to have to come out of pocket more money than what you're getting in proceeds from that exchange, the relinquished property. And so, you know, somebody's saying, well, you gotta replace debt. That's not correct. You, you can, if you're giving up a property that's 50% loan to value and, and let's say it's a half million dollar property and you go out and buy a new property at a half million with no debt, you're totally fine. So once again, you can offset 
what we call mortgage boot, a reduction mortgage with cash, but you cannot offset cash boot, that's cash received with additional mortgage, okay? So any money that comes out, I don't care if it's what you put down, the first money out is gonna be taxable to you, period. This is an exchange diagram, this shows how things flow. You, the exchanger, you're up top, we're in the middle, you give us a property, we sell it to the buyer, the deed goes straight from you to the buyer, the money comes to us. Once again, if you have actual or constructive receipt of the funds, you've got taxes. So from that settlement day, you've got 45 days to identify what you'd like to acquire, a total of 180 days to buy one or more of those properties you've identified. Those timelines go very, very quickly. Ben's gonna tell you, you know, you got to have things locked down today. People are not gonna wait around. If you say have a contingency offer, it's not gonna work. Uh, my advice is you better be looking for the property before you ever sell yours. And we could buy the replacement property the day your relinquished property closes. And we can wire funds straight from uh, one escrow to the next if you need to, or it could be 180 days later. But I would say do whatever you can to close the deal inside the 45 days just because it's a difficult world we're in. So when you buy that property, and you could have negotiated the purchase, put earnest money down, have it all set to go before we're ever involved, and then you just need to let us know whether you wanna be reimbursed the earnest money when we go buy the property for you. On the other hand, if you wanna leave the earnest money in there, that's totally fine. Uh, you can always add funds to that transaction. So if we look at the right side of this diagram, you know, we're gonna take the money, buy the replacement property, ownership flows through us, back to the taxpayer up top, the deed goes straight from the seller to the exchanger in this situation. Examples of times where we wouldn't have direct deeding or it doesn't follow this structure is, is a warehouse transaction. For example, a reverse exchange. If you have to buy first and sell later, we can do that. You cannot legally have ownership of both the new and old property at the same time, so we create a limited liability company to take ownership of the new property, for example, and, and you would show up the purchase with the money, you loan it to us, we buy it, our LLC owns it. When your property sells, we then give you the new property, the proceeds from the sale we use to repay the debt we had to you. In effect, the money that you came in desperate with, that was borrowed by us uh, from you and we repay that debt when your property sells in the future. That's a reverse exchange. That's a, technically, it's called a, a warehouse replacement reverse exchange if we're taking title of the new property, which is the same structure as an improvement exchange. If you said, hey, I wanna go build something, that's a parking transaction, warehousing transaction. It's gonna be the same structure, basically. We're gonna create an LLC, takes ownership of the asset, goes vertical, builds it out, and then when we run out of time, run out of money, or meet the exchange value equity requirements, we're gonna then transfer the new improved property back to the taxpayer completing the exchange. So if you got on this call thinking, hey, we're just talking about delayed exchanges, you can now see there's a whole variety of things you can do with this process if you have the people in place to do it and you have the time to plan it out. Timelines of 45 and 180 days, they go very, very quickly, right? So the 45 day, it's not 45 and 180 after the 45, it's 45 and a total of 180. Now that 45 day time period, you know, we've got, uh, you know, it, it's a situation where it starts at settlement. Identification means that you're giving what the government would deem an unambiguous description of the property. So that could be a common address, including city, state, and zip. Now, let's say Ben and I are going to go buy something together, and Ben's going to pick up, uh, let's say, 70% of, of it, and I'm picking up 30% of it. So let's say we both ID'd the whole property. Ben's identification would be fine because he received substantially the same thing as what he identified at 70%. I ID'd 30% of it, I, or I ID'd the whole thing, I'd only picked up 30. My identification would not be sufficient in that situation. I did not receive substantially the same thing as what I identified. So when you're buying with other people in a 1031, it's totally fine, you can do that. It's gotta be tenancy in common, you cannot, buy into or sell out of a limited liability company. Membership interest in the LLC or partnership interest are specifically prohibited from 1031. So when we're looking at, at a, a jointly owned property, you're typically gonna look at tick structure, tenancy in common, and the 1031 is gonna allow you to go in and out of that without a problem. If you've got something in, in a, a LLC format, you know, Ben's gonna call me up maybe a year before you sell it, you're talking about selling it, we're gonna talk about ownership and we're gonna break that entity, we're gonna do what's called a drop and swap. So what that means, 
is, is simply that slang for a deed from the entity to the individual's tenancy in common. You're then going to hold the property tenancy in common predisposition so you can defendably uh, argue that you held the property for investment pre-sale. So that's sort of the, the the, the track that we have to take if we're looking at partnership interest, we have to convert it to an interest that is exchangeable and that all takes time. But you know, people ask me all the time when, when I think they ought to think about an exchange, I'm gonna tell them, you know, ideally when you buy the property, you're not gonna own it forever, but when you first contemplate a sale, you better think about the exchange at that point, and talk about what's happening, understand, talk to your tax people, understand if you know what if any tax liability you're gonna have and that's up to you to decide if you wanna pay it. Once again, it's 45 and a total of 180 days. Now, the fine print of code uh, section 1031 says it's 180 days or the due date of your tax return. So at the bottom, that practice tip, the bottom of the slide basically says late, tr late year transactions. Don't be the eager beaver and file a tax return before you complete the exchange. So let's say this fall, October, November, December, you, you sell a property and and you haven't found what you want yet. Don't file your return until you've completed that exchange. If, if if you can't complete the exchange until after April 15th, you're going to file for an extension. So just be aware that's something that comes up year end that can cause people problems. Now, the other question, contemplate this. Now, if, if we actually see an increase in capital gains, they've talked about you know the, the, the changes in Section 1031, and there's even people that talk about that going retroactive. I think that would just be absolutely appalling it'd be ludicrous if that type of thing happened it would be you know the fiscally most irresponsible thing our government ever did because if you complete an exchange and now they say oh just kidding we passed this law before the end of 2021 and now exchanges are no longer in existence and now you've got to pay the tax you would have had to pay uh but you did the exchange imagine that you spent all your money bought a property and now they're going to say you got to pay the tax as though it wasn't an exchange that's, that's absolutely ludicrous but i can envision a situation where with capital gains tax rates if they bump the rates and you've got a situation where you've got a late late year transaction and you want to now they say okay effective uh january 2022 we've got this new increased capital gains tax rate well you're probably in a situation where you'd like to realize the gain in 2021 not 2022 so as far as receiving funds in an exchange you can only get money uh, when you've purchased uh, what was called the 1031 G6 rules, when you've purchased everything you have the right to buy. So if we're looking at late year transactions, I'm gonna tell you at that 45th day, you've gotta really think hard about what you're doing. Do you wanna complete the exchange? Don't just put a property in there as a fallback just in case, you know, just in case you find something you really want. Imagine you've identified a property that's a compromise, you don't really want it, and, and you satisfied the 45-day ID rule. Now on day 70, Ben's found your property that's perfect for you. I can't legally give you your money until you've purchased everything you have the right to buy, which means on day 181. That same problem exists if you're in an exchange and you wanna go into an opportunity zone. The OZ has the same 180-day timeline that 1031 does. So the OZ, you would have the opportunity to pull money out of your pocket if it's equivalent to what you would be using via you know, the proceeds. But otherwise, you need to get access to the 1031 money if you want to shift gears and go into an opportunity zone transaction. So this timing deal is very, very important. The identification is the most important thing in the exchange. And that 45-day timeline, do not sit around and wait. Work on it from the day you consider selling that property. Find what you want. Ask for whatever time you can. If, if we have to buy the replacement before the relinquish goes away, we can do it. We can use a reverse exchange. I've got a quick story on that 45 days and exactly that right. story you just said. You yeah. brought a property to market and uh, got a great offer from someone who's going to come in and pay cash. They sent over their letter saying, here's the funds available. Your 45 days ends April 15th. We got this letter April 30th. Our property was only on the market for like one day at that point. Yeah. I called the broker and I'm like, there's no chance you had our property on your ID period or on your on your identification two weeks yes. ago. The agent's response to me was, oh, you know what? It doesn't really matter. They just want to see that the types of properties that you're identifying are 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 actually eligible. So you can put any <laughs> address on it. As long as it's real estate, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, yeah. I look, I've been doing this for a while. If what you're saying had any ring of truth to it, I'm pretty sure we would know about it. 
Yeah. Let's confirm it with your accommodator. I called the accommodator. She's like, I can't speak directly, but she's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, make sure, make sure you don't ID a property two weeks after your 45 days. It doesn't work. Yeah, and, and, and the issue is that you really have that 45th day, it's a hard time. You've got to be either committed to completing the exchange at that date or, or let it go. I mean, yeah. it, it really don't don't just force yourself into a transaction that doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, if, if you've got the ability to maybe do something else later. I mean, don't don't have yeah. that adverse uh, feelings about that tax ramifications. You know, making a bad investment can be worse than the tax ramifications. I, I'm sure that anybody out there is, you know, anyone that's been investing in, in, in property or in things over a number of years is going to have situations that they haven't worked out right. But, you know, yeah. you know it's interesting because pre-1991, uh, there, these rules didn't exist. They, they were wide open. You could ID a county if you wanted. Uh, but hmm. since 1991, this is the way it's been, and you know, and it really hasn't changed at all since then. Now, I, I do want to say that that you know, a property does not have to be listed to be identified. Right. You're, you're, you know, you, you need to have it identified. And everybody assumes it has to be identified. To us, it's got to be identified to somebody that's a party to the transaction without an agency relationship. Now, who could that be? It could be the seller. It could be the seller's broker, I guess. It could be escrow, but you know, I'm going to tell you, get it to us because if if you're ever audited, the IRS is going to come knocking on our door looking for your ID. So you, you want to do it. You want to do it as conservatively as possible, and that's why I brought up the situation where you know Ben's getting 70, I'm getting 30 percent. I need to specify that you know I'm getting 30. You now if I get 35 percent, that's that's fine. I'm getting substantially the same thing. But you know, anytime you're buying in or out of a TIC or a DST, Delaware Statutory Trust, it's an institutionally offered uh, portfolio property, for example, that they've been structured just for 1031 purposes. But you, you know, you're typically looking at maybe a 30, 40, 50, 100 million dollar you know asset pool. So you're not going to buy the whole thing. I mean, you're going to buy some fraction of that, and you need to identify that fraction that you intend to pick up. Uh, you can change your mind over and over and over again. If you thought, hey, I'm going to be buying 15% of this, and it turns out you're at 17%, not That's a deal. Yeah, but if I'm you not, say 15 no. and it turns out it's 50, then it's potentially, yeah, yeah, potentially. then potentially yeah. you'd have a problem. You can't change yeah. your mind after the 45th day. We do have presidentially declared disasters that do extend things. Last year, uh, I mean, I don't know if we'd ever had them that, that impacted the Northwest, but last year we had a COVID extension, obviously. And then we had an extension for the fires. Uh, we, we typically, every year we have hurricanes and flooding uh, throughout the South and the East uh, that impact stuff. But you've got to be able to document that your exchange has been impacted by that presidentially declared national disaster. And I just want to stress that these three rules work independently of one another. So that, you know, that first rule is three properties that any value. Second one says you can ID more than three properties. Total value can't exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. Third option, you, you can ID more than three, they can exceed 200%, but you gotta close 95% of the aggregate value of all properties ID, meaning you're closing literally everything you've identified. So once again, my advice is do what you can to get it done inside the 45 days. Uh, if you're after the 45th day, you know, you just got to look at these numbers and understand what you're doing and, and really work to make something happen. But th these rules are, are the rules that have been in place since 1991. And I, I haven't heard any, any rumblings about them being changed since the late 90s when there was a proposal to get rid of uh, the identification period, which would have been wonderful, but it was buckled together with a true like-kind requirement. So remember when I said like-kind property referred to the nature of the investment, it would have gone house for house, land for land. So what do you think that would have done to the real estate? economy it would have just right. shut it down because you know i think about once again I'll, I'll, I'll throw back to the, like the farmers right i mean at some point they retire they can't farm the thing anymore and you know imagine okay yeah you can do an exchange you gotta get another farm that does them no, no good at all and like i said earlier most people start off with a rental house and they start moving into plexes and then eventually they end up into some type of commercial industrial whatever it might be and then at the end of the day they they finally get tired of you know the, the terrible tees, toilets, trash, tenants, turnover, and they end up going into some passive investment. Uh, you know, upreads a, a situation where you're basically exchanging into a property that read absorbs, and then you've got stocks. So it's like the ultimate installment sale. You just pay this 
pay the tax on the stock sales as you sell it. So there's all kinds of different things out there at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, maybe you're kind of while we're ben. on the property identification, let me ask you a couple of questions because we, we've had clients who sell, um, you know, like one client selling a 14 unit and then they're going to be buying six new construction duplexes, right? So just so just so I've got this, this clear, it's going to be more than three properties. The six are going to be, the total of the six will be more than 200% of the sales price, right? Because yeah. she's, you know, leveraging these properties. So all of that's okay as long as she closes on all six if she closes Correct. on five she's not hitting the 75 or the 95 percent mark. Right? exactly so so it's really critical that if you're working and, and keep in mind the values what, what what's something worth i mean my, my youngest brother is an mai appraiser he does land does big 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 things but uh you know i asked him hey greg how do you know you put the right number on something he said well it's pretty easy said, what do you mean by that he says nobody's too happy or too mad right but but yeah. you know if, if you look at if you look at a, a rental house for example um you know if it's not on the market what's it worth you're always looking at highest best use so it's going to be worth something different for you than it is somebody else uh you know i, right. I remember a couple of years ago we were working with somebody in the cannabis world and they were looking at a property that they were willing to pay probably 30 percent over market for because of where it was you know so once again when you're looking at the valuations we're looking at either the second or third rule there uh you know i'm gonna say you know that what it what the property's worth it's not necessarily what it's listed at it's what you're going to pay for it so if you've got psa's purchase sale agreements in place it's what that number says it's not what the thing's listed at, okay so so you've got some room there on the 200 percent the 90 the 95 percent is just i mean it it just means you're you've got to close everything you identify period yeah uh so you know my advice is get the transactions done inside the 45 days then none of these rules work there are none of them apply to your situation it's not that you don't work one last well, comment if you're buying a condo of a complex it's got to be a specific unit it can't be a unit of this complex it's got to be the unit this specific one yeah. ben you had a question yeah um i've got a question and we've got a couple more from elizabeth here so um someone's buying new construction uh within the 45 days you know they're platted out or maybe, maybe they don't maybe they don't have the the exact addresses like like how how could they identify the properties that will be completed ready for sale within six months but maybe at 45 days they don't have the proper identification uh, you know legal description legal description of the dirt and the uh, you know a description of the improvements what it is you know 2500 yeah. square foot house da, da 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 whatever it might be and the same things if we're doing an improvement exchange it's literally going to be the dirt and the you know the improvements what you're building so yeah that's that's exactly what you're going to do you're just going to idea do that thing now ben brought up an important point anybody on this call that's ever built a custom property okay now I, I say custom because it's different than if you're buying from you know somebody like polish homes or you know one of the big commercial you know builders right they've got teams of, of subs that all know they, they got to take care of them otherwise they're not going to get the next job so they've got budgets and timelines that need, need to be need to be met uh, the residential world i always joke uh, you know if you're having a custom home build uh, it's like hey twice as much twice as long but you've got to understand you've got to get you've got to have the ability to get the property yours within 180 days so if you've got a situation where you're buying a property that's under construction what happens if it's not done by your 180th day you've got to somehow be able to get ownership so what will happen and, and and the builder might have you know construction financing in place is going to go to perm when you buy the thing or something but what will happen is if we can in that situation buy on a land sale contract for example see, so they're going to wrap that first they're going to wrap the construction loan whatever it is with another contract that way title doesn't change until title doesn't change but ownership changes so understand the deed itself doesn't indicate ownership benefits and burdens of ownership do so you know a lot of times you might be looking at something and ben you probably had through the years you might gone out talking to somebody and you know you you get out of that meeting and you're under the impression one person owns the property and you get a title report that shows somebody else owns it well mm -hmm. you know so you're looking at benefits and burdens of ownership in these situations and and understand that oregon we're not in a community property state so even with spouses uh if if a property's in one spouse's name they want to add the other it's got to be done at the right times it's got to be taken care of and then you got to be able to justify it 
if you're if you're not fine if, if you've been filing jointly you've been married for a decade and, and one spouse isn't on the property that's an easy fix you're just going to have escrow do a correction deed out the spouse but if we were in a situation, let's say with the limited liability companies, for example, not a community property state, spouses can't even go in and out of an exchange. And I should have you know, made this point with Dan earlier, but you know, and I actually did say something about the cost of money on this thing, that you know, spouses in, in an LLC, it's gonna be more expensive money than if they can buy it directly. So if we're talking California or Washington, spouses can go in and out of a limited liability company through an exchange, Oregon, they cannot, and that's because we're not a community property state. Got it. Um, yeah. So I, I, we're, we're coming, we're coming up on seven fifteen. So here, here's yeah. what I think I'd like to do. Elizabeth has some questions that I'd like to run through real quick. Sure. And then can we just jump to the Q and A and everyone is yeah, listening? Certainly. There's just a couple examples on the, at the end of this. That they can look through. This is this is an example where there's 20, 24 different properties these people bought. Uh, all within the 45 days because she was CPA. She didn't want to lose the exchange. And we took them from, a, it was a $3 million gain on a Los Gatos property. We told them to move out of it. They moved out of it. They went from a million dollar tax hit to no taxes, got 24 different investment properties, got the home they wanted. So that's an example of a converted asset for a very good reason. And there's so just an example that's this sort of a, another one. You guys can take a look at it later. It's the, the other example that's on there is really, it's not 1031 anyway. It's 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 uh, I threw a curveball into what we call a rollover business startup. But anyway, fire away, Ben. I'm happy to answer. Cool. All right. Elizabeth asks, does a REIT qualify as light kind for 1031? No, it it, it doesn't, but an up REIT does. So that was what I mentioned very quickly. So uh, a REIT is a stock. Uh, you cannot exchange in or out of a REIT. But an up REIT basically is a situation where you're you're buying a property, the REIT's going going to absorb, and you ultimately get your ownership on the property converted to shares of, of the REIT. So uh, they are not very often out there and available. I know Cantor Fitzgerald out of New York just offered one or is in the process of maybe it's coming out this week, and they expect it to be fully subscribed within minutes. Uh, for anybody that's on this call that that had the unfortunate uh, uh, event of owning what was uh, SunWest Management out of Salem, it was assisted living. That was a tenancy and in, institutional tenancy in common offering. We had lots and lots of people buying into that thing, and it was it was great at one point, but it ended up the state's largest, most complicated bankruptcy. The company that took over that with the, the reorganization all, they took it over and they turned everybody that wanted to roll into an upreap did. So that's that that was what rescued. And the people, honestly, that the, the people that could roll forward in, out of the Sun West mess into the upreap were actually made whole, which is a pretty amazing mm -hmm. thing. The people that the people that really got stuck in that situation were the people that didn't have the ability to roll into it. But uh, yeah, back back to the REIT. You can't just buy into a REIT. It's got to be an up REIT, and you got to find somebody that's going to offer that. Got it. Um, I think this is this is answered with uh, what we just talked about. Uh, Elizabeth asks, is there a limit on the number of properties you may use to replace your sale in the 1031? Um, and it sounds any like number, no. Yeah. All of them. Any number of relinquished or replacement properties, fine. You can give up 20 properties, buy one. You can give up one and buy 20. It doesn't really matter. It's wide open. It's you're you're going to make uh, Ben work hard because he's going to have struggle to time all these things. And, and I guess a comment: if you're giving up a portfolio of property, maybe you're giving up ten properties and you're buying a couple, or maybe you're, you want to buy one. Uh, whatever we can sell before the acquisition happened, that can come in as a delayed exchange. If you've got the money to money that represents the future sales of the residual properties, we can use that money coming into the same group of properties as a reverse exchange. So what I'm saying is from the first sale, you'd have 180 days uh, to buy something. And then from the date of acquisition, you'd have 180 days to sell the properties that came in via the reverse exchange. So you could take almost up to a full year to get out of my yeah. example, 10 properties into one property if it's structured correctly. Structured correctly. Got it. And uh, if you purchase something under construction in a housing development from a developer, is this a reverse exchange? The answer is no, but you wanna explain reverse exchange versus a, re a standard exchange? 
Yeah, and, and, and I, I guess I got a comment on that scenario too. Uh, but, but yeah, reverse just means we're gonna buy first, sell later. So you have to have the economic, uh, you know, the financial ability to buy something without the other selling. We don't loan money. So if you don't have the financial ability to get the deal done, then we can't do the exchange. So if you've got the money to do the reverse, we can do it. Uh, it's always going to be a question of how we structure it. And the structure is going to be dependent upon how much money you got coming out versus what, what uh, you've got coming in via the exchange. So you, you've got to look at the amount of money to put down versus what you expect to net. And then if there's financing involved and, and, and we were looking to, re, you know, let's say warehouse the, rever the replacement property, we'd need a bank that would allow us to do that. So you've got, in, in addition to, and I want to mention this, uh, delayed exchange one-to-one is like 1500 bucks. A reverse exchange, the setup fee is 5500 So, you know, you got a lot more money involved with the exchange. And in addition, you probably have more costs with the bank and, and you might have some other transfer costs, other things. So it's more expensive. But with that said, we're doing lots of reverse exchanges right now because the market's so tight, right? Yeah. I mean, people just don't want to sell something and be stuck and end up losing an exchange. So they're doing lots of reverses. And, you know, you look at that cost, it's not that big a deal. But yeah. anyway, so um, what the the other comment, I, I, I just, what was the other thing I wanted to say? It's about it being new new construction in a development. Oh, yeah. So so once again, back to your ability to get the property transferred to you. And, and if, you know, the financing that's involved with this thing, it, it, you know, an improvement exchange means we're going to take title of something, build it out, and then convey the improved property. So that's one way to do it. If we're talking about, I had a call today, and, and our client's buying this property, it needs new roof. He doesn't want to put a roof on it because he's going to knock the thing down within the next uh, 24 to 36 months. But, you know, what's the lender want? The, the roof needs to be good for X years, right? So the lender wants a new roof on it. Now, now that, you know, the seller doesn't want to pay for it. And, you know, the cost of the roof, I think in this scenario, I don't remember where it was in the country, but it's like 15, 20 grand. Um, and, and so that's not enough to justify us doing an improvement exchange because an improvement exchange starts off at 6,500. So that's roughly the tax consequence, just pulling the money out. So in that situation, I just say, just pull the money out as, as boot, as taxable to you, but you're doing this work on the property it might normally be capitalized, but I'd say you expense it to offset the, the boot. So your net tax would be zero, but you're, you're always looking at how to get the property, make sure that it's done. We can't give you the property, then do improvements. The improvements, if we're building something, it's gotta be done before you receive it. Perfect. So the follow-up from Elizabeth. So the only risk of purchasing a house under construction is if you can't close in 180 days. Correct. But you, you alluded to potentially uh, buying it you know, wrap contract or something. So, you know, it's really, it's up to the builder and, you know, they've, they've just, they, you know, they've got to assure you, give you assurances it's going to get done. If it's not going to get done, I think it's a conversation that, or if it might not get done, we need to have that conversation sooner rather than later. Hey, you know, if we get to the 180th day and it's not done, how are we going to get ownership transferred to me? And, and that wrap contracts the way that you can got get it. it done. Got it. Perfect. So the 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 number one questions that that always that always come up for me are what is like kind which we talked about right real estate for real estate held for investment it can be land it can be a duplex it can be a house it can be apartments it can be a pickle factory doesn't matter <laughs> if it's real estate held for investment then you're good Correct. second question is always the 45 days when does that start when when who do I need to give that ID period to we touched on that uh 45 days starts from the day that you close on the sale correct right settlement so day yeah so your settlement day so you got 45 days ideally you've got something under contract my, my advice to my clients is especially in a limited inventory market like we've got you want to cross off as many properties as you can there's only five properties out there you can, you don't have time in 45 days to get offers accepted on all five right so you start making your offers early cross off the ones that you're not going to do. You're going to get in, do your inspection. If it doesn't work, you're moving. If the first one works, great. Close on it before your 45 days is up and you're fine. Exactly. The rest of it, the, the rest of that six months, that 135 days to close, you just have to close on something that you've identified. If Correct. you can't close on something that you've identified and it's day 46, 
that money sits in an account until six months and one day, right? Very, very big point, Ben. So, so like I said, you can only get money out of the exchange per the 1031 G6 rules, which say you can only get money after you've purchased everything you have the right to buy, which means at no time prior to the 45th day, and only after the 45th day after you've purchased what you've got the right to buy. So in our ID form, let's say the top section has the three property rules. So it's gonna have three lines there. It says, okay, I'm identifying these three properties, write the addresses down. And then down below in the paragraph, there's a little blank and it says, I have the right to buy blank of these properties. Why do we do that? We do that because if you're IDing three properties with the intent of buying one, you can put one in there. Now let's say you don't spend all the money and we're now outside the 45 days. As soon as you purchase that property, even though you ID three, you said you only had the right to buy one, now we can give you the balance of your money, okay? If you didn't put one in there, now we're stuck with the money until day 181. Got so it. It, it's really important, and, and this is not, you know, equity advantage being mean. This is something we used to just release funds. If somebody wanted to pay their tax, our attitude was, gee, you know, if they want to pay their tax, Uncle Sam should be happy with that, let them have their money. But in, in the, I think it was in the early 2000s, there was a company out of Chicago that asked for some rulings from the federal government. And, and what they were aimed at is they wanted to keep the money, right? Because that's how exchange companies you know, make money is sitting on the money. And, and you know, so what happened is the government came back with a ruling that if we don't follow the 1031 G6 rules, then our policies and procedures are, are invalid. Therefore, uh, it's not just gonna impound, impact the guy that, that said, hey, I don't want, to do the exchange anymore, every exchange we did using that policy and procedure would be invalid. So in today's world, if you're working with an, an exchange company that's just gonna give you your money at will, I would not do that. I mean, nobody that does this for a living has been doing it is gonna give you money outside what's called the 1031 G6 rules. Got it. Um, couple of other questions. Well, uh, the, first, the, the one question, uh, what about a single member? So I, I know, the entity selling has to be the entity buying, right? So Ben Ficker buys it, he can't buy it uh, in a partnership with, well, I don't wanna complicate it. Entity selling, entity buying has to be the same, right? So uh, I'm looking at my Rand McNally now. Um, just, oh, Rand yeah. McNally LLC can't be the seller and then Ben Ficker's the buyer unless that's a single member LLC, correct? Correct, single member LLC, you can go in via an LLC and out individually or vice versa. Uh, another example would be revocable trust. You can go in and out differently. Uh, you can do, you know, a lot of times people sell third street apartments and buy on 10th street. They don't want 10th street apartments being named third street, right? So you can change the name of the LLC, that's fine. But yeah, it's gotta be disregarded entity, which that comes back down to community versus non-community property states with spouses. Got it, got it. Okay, um, and then the, the, la the last, I know we're coming up on time, but the last thing that I, something I'm dealing with right now, I've got a client selling a property out of state. He's got a pretty decent cash amount. He's selling, he's, he's selling something for 850, he's gonna end up with 500 cash. The other 350 is roughly his debt, right? Yeah. He wants to buy something cash with his 500, which means his 350 of of debt is going to be considered boot. Correct. Right? So he's going to owe tax on that. So my advice to him was, and tell me if I'm wrong here, my advice to him was buy something with the 350 debt and a little bit of cash and then take the boot in the form of cash. That way you've got cash to pay the tax. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you don't... And it's great advice, you don't pay tax twice, right? So, I mean, a, a reduction in value is gonna, so whatever the greatest reduction is, is gonna trigger the, the tax. Whether If you go down and value 300 and you pulled 200 in cash, you got boot of 300. You know, it's, you don't have boot of 500 there. So, yeah, you just gotta look at it. And the other thing is, like I said, 1031's not all or nothing. So, I've got lots of times when people would like to pull some money out. Maybe they need to pull money out. And, and you just basically say, okay, if my basis is 250 and I spend 300, I deferred tax on 50. Maybe I sold at 500, so to be whole, I gotta get a $500,000 property, but 
I don't want to spend that. So every dollar you spend over your basis represents tax deferred gain. And I never make assumptions on when it stops making sense. I had a CPA that had her personal deal and she refused to pay tax on $5,000. I had a client years ago that said, ah, heck, my tax hits only 800,000. I don't care, I'll just pay it. So, you know, my experience through the years is I never make assumptions on what is or is not acceptable to a client. And and really a lot of times, you know, people with, with less, it means more, right? I mean, because it means more to them. Every dollar means more. So, you know, some of these people at the top, it's all froth to them and it doesn't really matter that much, but anyway. Yeah, all right, I'm gonna take back control of the screen here and, uh... Make sure I'm showing that screen right there. Let's, uh, oh, wrong one. All right, let's wrap this bad boy up. Uh, David, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's always a pleasure talking with you. My clients are always so excited uh, by the time we, we, we finish up our deals with you guys. You guys do such a great right. job. So um, again, uh, if you're here, if you're listening, reach out to me if you have any questions about the current state of the market, buying, selling investment properties. Reach out to Dan Hayes uh, if you're looking at professional management. I, I talk with a lot of managers. There's not a lot I recommend. I'm happy to recommend Dan. Same thing with uh, with Tender. I, I got to point out, you guys nailed your URL and your phone number. Just 1031exchange.com and your phone number ends in 1031. It is so perfect. I, I wish you. I had the foresight to do that 20 years ago, but yeah, it didn't work no, out. Nice job. Well, um, Reach out to David and his team, whether it, whether it's for an exchange or whether it's a, a self-directed IRA. Uh, these guys know what they're doing. There, there, there's a handful of people out there who, who know how to get a 10th an exchange done. What I love about your team, David, is you have other solutions besides the, this is the in-the-box, regular, transactional thing, right? Thanks, a lot, a lot yeah. of people can do that. Not a lot of people can come up with other solutions that you might not have thought of. Uh, David's team is perfect for that. So uh, really appreciate all of this. Our information is on these slides. We're going to get you the slides with the replay, which we'll send out tomorrow. Um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. David, thanks again. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.